Hi everyone. Uh, we'll just give everyone uh, 30 seconds more just to make sure we've got any got everyone attended. You can see the numbers are just still increasing slightly, so we'll give everyone just a few more seconds. Okay, it just seems to be levelling out. So all we'll do is we'll get started. So welcome or welcome back if you've attended these uh, webinars in previous years uh, to uh, what's new release. Uh, so in this session today, we're going to be talking through uh, what's new for Inventor and Vault 2024. Um, just a little bit of kind of housekeeping before we get started. So I'm going to be talking for around 45 to 50 minutes today. Um, if you do have any questions, we're going to have some time at the end. Uh, we should have 10, 15 minutes at the end just to kind of run through any questions. Um, so if you just want to pop them in the chat window uh, and we'll run through them together um, and we'll do that for both the inventor and the vault side. So if you do have any questions on the inventor side, pop them in and then we'll, we'll run through them at the end. Um, I'm also going to pop my uh, personal email up at the end as well, uh, as long with any other kind of links that I've talked through uh, throughout the presentation. So if you do have any um, kind of questions relating to your business, then feel free to drop me an email uh, directly um, and I can come back to any kind of questions that, we, that we've got. So just a, a little bit of an introduction to myself. Uh, if you haven't attended one of these webinars before, uh, my name is Jason Kelly uh, and I'm an application specialist here at Symmetry. Uh, my key focus areas are around the inventor professional um, package as well as kind of some of the surrounding add-ins that come with it. So we've got our Sevilla toolkit and our Sevilla routing, um, as well as kind of the, the woodwork uh, for inventor package as well. Um, and then I also focus around the data management side. So what we do with that CAD data uh, once we uh, have created it and how we manage and control that data. So again, they're the kind of the two key focus areas that I look at. And obviously that's what we're gonna be running through in, in today's session. So let's start off with just a, a little bit of an agenda then on um, what we're gonna be running through today. So in the first half of the session, we're gonna be running through the inventor package. So what's new in the 2024 release? We'll start out with a bit of an introduction and then we'll kind of look at some of the new tools and features that they've introduced uh, into the software. Now, as with every release, there's kind of no major overhaul with uh, Inventor um, because it's becoming quite an experienced product now, um, but there's lots of kind of ways that Autodesk tend to uh, improve the software with things like performance um, and automating some manual tasks and then putting in some uh, new tools as well. And then for the second half of the session, what we're going to do is we're going to look through uh, the Vault side. OK, so we'll look at it from a, a data management side and the, the new tools and features they've introduced. And it seems actually in this release, um, there's quite a new, uh, quite a few new features uh, looking for uh, looking at the automation element of Vault. So let's get started then with uh, Inventor Professional. And with every release, Autodesk tend to uh, have a look at kind of three key focus areas. One of the main ones that they always tend to focus around is performance. So making sure the software is updated with all the latest specs um, so that the, the software runs as smoothly as possible and getting rid of any kind of bugs from previous releases and making sure that everything is, is working correctly. Um, they've also, in this release, focused around, as I say, automation um, and kind of stopping kind of these manually uh, laborious tasks and trying to automate some procedures so that um, you as kind of day-to-day -day users are spending a lot of your time just kind of doing repetitive tasks over and over again and also the core modeling workflows so they also look around to try and give the, a good base level and living up to the standards that's, that are kind of continually uh, being updated one thing i did want to just point out a lot of the tools and features in this release and in previous releases are focused around the inventor ideas forum so if you have a quick search in Google for the Inventor Ideas Forum, again, I'll pop some links out to you um, at the end of the session um, to the forum. But if you have a quick Google search for it, what you're able to do is you're able to look at other people's opinions on what they might be, um, other people's uh, thoughts on what they might think improve the software. OK, so tools and features that they might want to uh, look at. In there, you can choose to vote for um, features and that will flag up on the Autodesk system if it gets a, a required number of votes for the developers to take a look at that. If you do have any ideas, get them posted on there. Obviously, feel free to come to us as well and we can help try and, and upvote them and make sure that everyone's looking at uh, the new feature if we if we think it's something that's uh, a relevant tool. 
Um, so it's definitely worth just having a little look around and seeing kind of what ideas people have, um, because obviously if you're using it day to day, you're going to see and experience some of these um, kind of downfalls or, or small um, aspects of the product that, that they might not. So let's actually get started with some of the new tools then. Uh, and one of the first new tools that I'm going to introduce today is the, the section views. So in previous releases, a section view um, didn't have much kind of editability or accountability. So you'd be able to create your half section view based off of a plane um, and you draw out your section view within your model. And what would happen is if you wanted to edit or change that, there was no kind of real option to do that. So what they've done is they've made it into more of a feature so that you can now go in and make some changes uh, necessary to it. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to play this short clip. OK, and what we're going to do is we're just going to create a half section view within there. So, again, what you'll see as normal is you can create your half section views by selecting on a face and moving it. What you'll notice is you've now got a little sub menu where you can rotate the plane based off of that plane that you've pushed it in off of. And it will use the UCS to rotate around a specific angle of your choosing. So, again, you can now create more kind of custom and niche angles. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to pause it there for a second. And if you have a look, what it's now doing is it's now also linking it to your view representations. So if you select on or expand down your representations folder, you can right click on the view rep that you're currently active in. And you've now got a section view option in there. You've got two options. You can either edit the section view or you can suppress the section view. If you edit the section view, what it's going to give you the option to do is it's going to bring up that little sub menu and you've now got some options to, to kind of drive from that specific point that you're at. So, OK, so I've rotated it and now I'm going to move it down a little bit further. You've also got the option to suppress the section view. And what I quite like about this is it's kind of like a save function for um, for your section views. You could create the section view, go away, make some more changes to your model and then bring it back to that particular view. So what you could have is you could have a number of view reps all set up with different varying section views within there. So just to point out as well that this uh, new function is available within the part and the assembly environment as well. The next new function that we're going to have a look at is bounding boxes. Now, if you haven't seen or you're not aware of what a bounding box is, I'll just quickly run through um, what it is and then how they've updated it in this 2024 release. So a bounding box, you can see from the model on the top right um, at the top right of the screen. Um, what it's going to do is it's going to create uh, a box to the outer limits of the model so that you can judge um, for space. So if, for example, this is a machine going into a factory, what you might want to do is you might want to send out your machine to um, the customer who's designed the factory layout. Um, and then within there, you might want to give kind of the IP away of the uh, model. So what you would do is you'd send out the box. You can then they can then send that, uh, put that box into the uh, model, check that it fits for space, and then you can um, carry on working or, or redesign depending on, on what you need to do. And you haven't given away kind of the full details of the model. And also it might be things like to reduce file size as well. So this was introduced into the simplify command uh, a couple of releases back. And what they've done is they've updated that um, in two areas now. I've updated it again in the simplify option. So what you had previously is you've got you had three areas that you could create a bounding box. You could create it at top level, you could create it at a component level, and you could create it at a part level. So what it would do at part level is it would create a bounding box around every component that's in there. So at top level now, what they've given you the option to do is to amend that length, width, and height values of that bounding box. And I think probably one question that you might be asking yourselves is maybe why would they do that? Um, purely because um, obviously you're designing it so that it goes to the outer limits of the model. It might be that you're wanting to account for um, health and safety. You might be when you're putting that machine in the factory, you might want to account for a little bit of space around um, the machine so that um, you, you haven't got any kind of moving components or that it's not getting tucked in and, and um, doesn't fit in the required space. Uh, it might be for tolerancing as well. You might want to add a small tolerance onto the end of your uh, your bounding box. So what you do when you do it at the top level, you will just fill in the details. It will automatically publish the sizes and then you can amend them if you do require. 
We've also got an option now to create our model parameters. So this is just a checkbox in the advanced properties section. So what that will do is when you create your bounding box, what it's going to do is it's going to automatically export all of them length, width and height parameters into the, the parameters window. Again, you could then pull that through to your drawing or something like uh, your bill of materials or your title block to make sure that you've got the kind of the outer limits um, shown within there. We've also, um, it's also been updated in the derive function. So you've got um, a now a new option if you're deriving in a component. What you've got is the option to select on this little kind of green circle. So if you're bringing in a body, again, you might be receiving uh, the model from a third party um, and you can select on this option. And what it's going to do is it's going to bring in bring in the model as a bounding box. So again, you could be the one that's receiving that machine and you, you're putting it into a factory layout and you don't want to have to deal with the file size um, of a component. You might just want to judge the space um, saving within there. So what you can do is if you select on this little green circle, it's going to give you the option to um, put a bounding box around the edge. There's also an extra tool or an extra checkbox in that options uh, tab that you can use an oriented minimum bounded box. So the bounding boxes by default um, appear so that they're going to be based off of the origin coordinate system of the part file. So we use the, the origin UCS and just go, what is the maximum length, width and height? If you choose to orient the, the bounding box, what it will do is it will rotate and find the minimum requirement required size for that particular model. OK, so that's just a little checkbox if you want to, to change that on the uh, derive function. So the next tool that I'm going to run through is the finish command. Now, the finish command is probably one of the, the bigger um, features, this new tools that they've introduced in this release. And what it's going to allow you to do is it's going to allow you to assign an appearance to a particular face, but more importantly, the manufacturing process. So what you can do is you can now assign um, a manufacturing process to a particular face, um, and it's going to be based off one of five categories. Now, you can do that at part, at part level, component level, and assembly level within there. So Autodesk have defined manufacturing processes and the appearances into five key areas. So obviously, you've now got your appearance, so you can apply an appearance override to that particular face. Um, the difference between just applying an appearance override and doing it through the finish command is it will give you some extra properties that you can fill in um, and you can also um, edit that feature um, because it appears in the model browser as a feature. We've then got our um, some of our other kind of categories that the defined manufacturing processes into. So the first one is material coating. So this could be something like your zinc coating. Um, we've got heat treatments, maybe something for like case hardening or uh, annealing. Uh, we've got surface texture. This can be things like uh, for grinding or polishing. And then we've got paint. Now, by default, Autodesk have included uh, a list of kind of default um, processes under each of these categories. We'll, we'll have a little look um, at the, the material coating processes when we, we choose the drop down. But obviously, I'm aware and everyone's aware that maybe you might have a niche uh, manufacturing process that doesn't pull through correctly, or you might want to amend some of the kind of the, the default properties they've included within there. So what they've done is they've included um, a finished XML spreadsheet in your design data where you can go through and you can amend and add in your own custom manufacturing processes. Unfortunately, due to kind of time restraints today, we're not going to get a chance to, to run through that kind of full spreadsheet and how you can edit that. Uh, we are going to look to kind of produce some form of documentation, whether that be a video or a, a kind of a blog post or something like that um, on how you can edit this spreadsheet. Um, but yeah, we won't have a, a chance to run through that today. So let's have a little look then at how um, you can apply a finish to your model and where it's going to appear and where the kind of the properties can be edited uh, and inputted. So again, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start this um, short video and the finish command sits in the create, uh, sorry, in the modify area in the 3D model ribbon. 
Now, the first thing that it's going to ask for is to select on the faces. So for this example, I've just selected across all of the faces. It might be that you want to select on individual faces and apply different feature or different manufacturing process to different faces. In the next up down, we've got the behavior. So again, using one of them five um, categories that I've just run through. And then we've got our process. So if I just press play and pause, OK, we can drop down and we can select on a particular um, manufacturing process that Autodesk have defined in there by default. And what that's going to do is it's going to give us then some options. We can change the appearance within there and we can also amend some of these properties that they've included. So there's some kind of custom values that you can input, things like the description value. Um, you can add a short description. You can amend the thickness of the manufacturing process and you can also add a comment. So the comment box can be quite useful if you're sending this down to your workshop. You could add in the comment and then they can pick up them comments on the drawing or in the model if they've got access to it. So what that's going to do when you hit OK, it's not going to appear at the bottom of your model browser as a new feature. It's going to submit into a new folder called finishes. OK, that will appear once you've applied your first finish. Now, just to point out in here, you can apply more than one finish to a particular face as well if you need to. You've then got the options. You've got your standard edit, suppress and delete options where you can go back in and edit the feature. One of the main areas that's been introduced is the option in your parameters. Once you've created your new finish constraint, or your new finish feature what you've got is this new finish parameters area and what that's going to do is it's going to bring through all of them properties that you gave in that particular feature now there's a few areas that are going to be grayed out and these are the ones that are derived from the spreadsheet that finish.xml file now to edit these values you can't edit them in your parameters you're going to have to edit them by right clicking and editing the feature but for some of the other kind of the custom property values that, um, that you can input, you can edit them within your parameters section. Now, because it's driven into your parameters, there might be something that you want to amend or you might want to drive it out to your eye properties. So you can drive it out to your eye properties in the normal way. Firstly, by selecting the option to export your parameter. And then if you right click on the, oops, sorry, if I just jump back into there, if you right click on the particular parameter that you want to select on, there's an option to um, export to your custom property format. OK, and what that's going to do is going to give you the little dialog box to choose kind of your precision. You hit done. That's going to then drive that into your custom eye properties. So you could then pull that through to something like your bill of materials or to your drawing template as well. OK, so it might be that you want to add it into your um, title block so that you can pull that through. So it gives you a few options um, in your parameters to, to export that. Unfortunately, at the minute, they are all manual. So just something to be aware of. <clears throat> Excuse me. One of the key um, features that I quite like about the, the finish command is that it functions with model states. Now, we spoke about model space states a couple of years back. Um, and you can use model states for kind of a number of reasons. One of the first um, reasons that you might use model states is to show your manufacturing stages and pop that on a drawing to go through kind of your, your full manufacturing process. So because you can now kind of have a full rounded approach and show all of your manufacturing processes or all of your finishes onto your model, you can add them in at different model states. It just gives you some options to um, put them through into each model state. So you could then show on a drawing, you could show maybe a cast model and then show what finishing type that you want to apply to it. So the next feature that I'm going to talk through from the inventor side is um, the new snippets that have been added to the iLogic browser. So with kind of every release, Autodesk tried to link between softwares, make easier to work between softwares um, in the, the product design and manufacturing collection. Uh, and this has been introduced with these new snippets um, in the Vault, in the iLogic browser for Vault. Just to point out before we get started with this one, um, it is only available in Vault Professional. You won't be able to uh, link out to uh, any files in Vault Basic. But what it gives you is it gives you the option option to check in or check out files 
directly through your iLogic rules. OK, you can also get files and also search for files within your vault and do things like pull down the thumbnail um, of the, the particular file. So it gives you all of these snippets that are available that you can start to build your rules up from. Now, what they have released and it's um, quite a, a powerful um, tool and it's quite hidden at the minute is that you can um, download or if you search for Inventor 2024 sample files, it gives you a full list of some rules that Autodesk have produced. Um, and what you can do is you can copy these rules uh, and um, paste them into your, your rules that you're working at the minute, or you can add them into your external rules folder um, and start to utilize some of the rules that they've already produced. So again, it's just saving time on kind of redoing everything that Autodesk have already done for you. So I'm just going to show in this short clip just a simple rule of how you can check in and check out. So again, I've added these to my external rules location. If I right click and run the rule, what it's going to do is it's going to simply check that file into Vault by bringing up the menu. OK, and then I can get it to check out the file as well. Now, what's quite useful about this and something that I definitely recommend having a look through, and I'm just going to jump out of the presentation now, um, is in that file, they give you a PDF document. And that PDF document gives you some um, details on all of the rules that they've created. It also shows you how you can set it up in your system. And then for every rule, it gives you about 25 rules, 20 to 25 rules within there. And for every rule, it goes through and gives you um, the requirement for the rule and then the method, so how that rule's been created and what snippet that it's using and then also some tips that you might want to um, utilize with it so it's definitely worth even just downloading that package just to have a quick scan through this pdf um, that is available within here okay so just going to touch on some of the smaller features that have been introduced uh, into Inventor now. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, the Fusion 360 um, or the interoperability between the, the softwares and the packages within the collection is always in being updated. Uh, that's from um, the last kind of maybe three or four releases. They're trying to sync between the platforms better. Um, and you will have seen in previous releases I've spoken about um, the Fusion 360 ribbon and how you can directly take your models now into maybe an analysis or a, a CAM module within Fusion 360. So that's exactly the same with what they've done in this release. They've included a manual inspection uh, option so you can take it directly from Inventor into the manual inspection environment in Fusion 360. Now, one other feature that they've introduced is um, an option that to update your Inventor models into Fusion Team. So previously, if you were to export uh, your Inventor file into Fusion Teams, you'll get this little Fusion Export folder here, okay, appearing in your model. Now, you would then work on the file in Fusion. What you might want to do then is update the model in Inventor. Okay, you might be continually updating that model in Inventor, and it's quite difficult previously to sync the model to update it. You would just have to send it up as a new version to, to drop in there. Okay. Um, what we can do is now we can um, set it up so that if we right click on the Fusion Exports option, there's an option to open in Fusion 360. And what it's going to do is it's going to scan your Inventor file in comparison to the Fusion Export uh, into the Fusion Teams location and see if it's out of date. If it is out of date, it will then ask you or prompt you, do you want to sync it or do you want to upload a new version into Fusion Team? So it allows you to work on or bring the best out of the software in Inventor and then Fusion as well by working in kind of the modeling environment in Inventor and then using kind of maybe one of the advanced um, environments in Fusion. So again, just another small feature um, for the mark capability. So there's now an option similar to how we um, set it up uh, in the emboss tool we can now wrap it to a particular face. So if you've got a sketch or some text that you're wrapping to a non-planar face or to a curved face, you've now got the option on this bottom 
uh, button here to select and wrap it to that particular face uh, within there. You've still got the same option to project to the face and that will still work to the non-planar face. It will just put it onto that particular face. Um, but you do have both options now uh, into depending on how you want to export that particular file. And the final thing I'm going to talk through from the inventor side is the rendering and view settings. So the first thing I'm just going to mention is about Inventor Studio. So you've now got the option for 16K resolution uh, in Inventor Studio. OK, uh, so it's giving you high quality uh, images that you can export. You can also export um, or create now custom image based lighting images as your backgrounds um, within uh, Inventor. So previously, and if you're aware, there's a, a view option in Inventor where you can put your file into a specific scene and it will use all of the lighting based on that scene in the ray tracing environment. If you do have an HDR or an EXR image, you can now create your own um, background now. So you could import it into an image that fits kind of more or a scene that's more relevant to your industry. Also, for the CPU and GPU ray tracing, it will now include the background when you're actually creating your rendered or ray trace uh, components within there. Again, just another small feature that I've introduced, um, the thread support. So GPU ray tracing, which is using the graphics card to create your renders um, for the ray tracing environment. It is still a pre-release, um, so they're still kind of working on that in the background. Um, but it does now support threads so that it can include threads when you're creating your renders. OK, so that's everything from the inventor side. Now, obviously, I'm not going to have a chance to run through absolutely everything in inventor. Um, there are some uh, quite a few new smaller features that they've introduced um, again. What you can do is in your inventor application, there's an option on the home page in the bottom left corner for what's new. And you can then access um, and see kind of Autodesk detailed out um, all of the small features that I've introduced. And I've also done a video on it as well uh, that you can take a look through uh, on some of the smaller features that are in there. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look through uh, the vault side of things now. And again, Autodesk tend to focus around kind of three key areas. And the main two that they're focused on for the 24 release for Vault is the productivity and the automation side. Um, this is again stopping kind of manually laborious tasks for the end user um, to, to kind of automate proceedings and, and make it easier because most of the designers aren't going to want to spend a lot of time in Vault. They're going to want to actually spend time in Inventor and, and manufacturing. Okay. Um, the data management side is going to try and be as automated as possible and you'll see this with some of the kind of the new export functions that we're going to talk through shortly they've also focused um, a little bit around the security element so what we can do is or what we'll have a look at is the new backup methods that they've introduced and also um, the peer review uh, phases that they've introduced as well within there Let's first take a look at kind of some of the new automation tools that they're focusing around. Now, previously, you were able to export PDF functions within Vault. OK, that was the only kind of file type that you were able to export directly out of Vault, as well as maybe your, your visualization file as well. What they've introduced in this release is the kind of the automated options for step and for DXF files. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to bring up a, a standard kind of uh, life cycle process um, here up on screen. So what we can do is we can automate when files or when these step files and DXF files are going to be produced. So what a designer would do is move it from work in progress to approval. At that point, you might create your visualization files, so the approver. Maybe they're using Vault Office. They can then look at the file. And go right yeah happy with that i'm going to move it from approval to released now at this point that would have had to be a manual process in the past to go and create a step file for your 3d files or um, a flat pattern dxf what you can do now is on the transitional state between approval and released you can send a job off the job processor that's going to run and create a step file 
or a flat pattern DXF file. Okay. And that file is going to be generated to um, a particular location. And that location is based off exactly the same settings as the PDF export. So just to point out, when you are exporting one of these particular um, file types within your model, um, it's going to give the same export options as it did um, in uh, the Inventor browser as well. So if you're exporting to step, you might be expo exporting step file as a 203 step file or as a 214 as a 242. Um, or the flat pattern DXF, you might choose a particular version of AutoCAD that you want that file to be able to be accessible within. Uh, so then same options will be within uh, the Vault settings. So what we can do is we can still publish it to the same kind of locations as the PDF export within Vault. So this, you've got two options. You can publish it to a local drive, in okay, case so that's to your file explorer um, and that can be either to a single folder so you might have a singular step folder within there and then you could export it to that particular folder um, and all of your step files when they get generated will go to that one folder structure you could also copy the vault folder structure so it, it will generate the file to where that particular uh, or the base file is going to be generated from it will generate it to that particular um, location and copy the vault folder structure that's, that's been generated. The second option is you can generate the files inside of vault, okay? And that's to the same location, to that step file, or to the same um, location as where that file was produced from. So you've got a kind of a few options within there. If you're wanting it to go to a kind of a project specific folder, um, then that'd be something that you'd need to use uh, our Sevilla Vault products for. We've also um, got some options um, to run it manually. So obviously we've talked about here running this um, as an automated procedure. Um, this that will kind of improve the compliance, making sure that every file has been generated at every point in time. Um, but you can just have that as kind of a right click option in Vault is to kind of generate a step file maybe for your release documentation or as a, a flat pattern DXF. So the next tool that we're going to have a look at is peer reviews. And peer reviews um, are kind of a new um, feature that Autodesk have introduced into Vault. Um, and it gives you a user or gives companies kind of a stricter uh, overview of how they want to kind of move through their life cycle. So it's going to allow people to stop or allow companies to stop users self-checking and self-approving their own work. Because we've all been there, we've all um, checked our own work and had a quick scan through and gone, yeah, everything seems right. Actually, there might be a spelling mistake or you might have made missed out a dimension on a drawing or something like that because you're just doing a quick scan over. You haven't got a fresh pair of eyes having a look over that model. So there was nothing in Vault previously that would stop users moving a file from work in progress to approval. And if they have approval properties, moving it from approval over to released. So what they've introduced now is a kind of a, a checking state between the transitions. So again, this is applied at the transitional state. So what we will have a look at is say designer one, they're going to move their file from work in progress to approval. Okay. They've then tried to kind of self-approve that their own drawing that they've created. And what it's going to do is it's going to give up uh, and, or prompt them with an error message now to say that that particular file has met the um, restrictions or has met the compliance rules. So I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but the same user can't move it from work in progress to approval and then move it from approval to released. What they would have to do is designer two who has um, the same level of um, security as designer one um, but they're under a they're logged into a different account they're then able to move it from approval to released again just ensuring that a second pair of eyes is going over um, that particular uh, check but as i mentioned this kind of has a, a secondary phase as well to peer reviews what you can do is you might not want to peer review every single file within your vault. So this is how the kind of the dialog box is going to look in your vault. 
So when you go from transitional state from review or approval to released, you'll see this new peer review section appearing. What you can do is you can set some kind of compliance checks to check whether that file um, is wants to go through a peer review. So what you might want is that all of your IDW or all of your drawing types go through that particular peer review check. Or maybe you want a specific user. So it might be that my drawings always need to, I can't self-approve my own particular drawings. So I could add in the author property so that my particular user can't self-approve my the own work. You might also have a particular project that is uh, a quite pressurised project that you might want everyone to have kind of uh, another fresh pair of eyes checking over the top. What you could do is you could put in the project number within there. So again, between the transitional states, it was scanned to see that if the file meets these um, states, what it will do is it will run through um, and give a uh, or run through that peer review check within there. So it's going to be quite good or quite useful for companies that have kind of got kind of quite a strict um, life cycle process. And you want to ensure that you've got that kind of um, second look or second view over that particular file. So the next tool that we're going to have a look at is the copy folder option. Now, the copy folder option seems kind of quite a simple tool um, in theory. But actually, I think a lot of people are going to like the look of this tool and like how this tool is, is working. So you could previously do this in Vault, but you would have to, it would involve quite a high level of configuration time um, because it would have to be involving with your data standards. This is now a simple option on the right click menu. So what it's going to do is if you've got quite a complex folder structure like this example here, or a project based folder structure that you're going to have uh, for each new project, you're going to have five folders. OK, so this example is showing five folders. So we've got third party photos, models, drawings and PDFs. Um, what this company wants to do is for every new project, they want to right click, copy the folder and it's going to copy all of them folders and create it as a new project. And it's not going to copy any of them files. So that's what this copy folder option is going to do. What's also quite nice about it is if, for example, you've got this third party folder and in that third party folder, you don't want any of the, the viewers, the group, the viewers, they don't they're not able to see any of the files or see that particular uh, third party folder. Now, you can also choose to copy the permissions across based off of um, the, the folder that you're copying from. So what you will get is if I were to or want to copy this project one, I would right click on that project one folder and go to copy folder. It would then bring me up with this dialog box. I can choose where I want to copy it to and also what I want to include. So I can choose to include the subfolders. I can choose to include the permissions and I can choose to include any properties that are associated with it. So it will copy the properties from one folder to another. So once I've run that copy folder and selected all the options that I want to choose, what it's going to do is it's then going to select and copy that folder structure to there without copying any of the files within there. Now, what I'd recommend with this is that you set up a particular template folder and you don't have it working on live folders. It will work absolutely fine on live folders. But again, the way we tend to see it set up in data standards is that you set it up at top level to where maybe your content and files are stored and the, the top level project explorer level is. Um, you can set that up so that the um, that you've got a templates folder and then you've got all of your base folder structure under that. So that anyone that's going in to create one of these projects, they could go into that folder and they know that all of the permissions and all of the uh, properties and the subfolders they're all in there and they're based off of a, a correct kind of output. So it's quite a nice, easy kind of user friendly change to make within your existing vault at the minute. OK, so the next function or tool that we're going to talk through is the design data and template management. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about how the design data and your inventor templates get managed at the minute in different kind of companies. And then we'll have a look at the new method that Autodesk have introduced. So the first method for storing your inventor templates, we'll talk about it as just a, as templates for now, um, but it is exactly the same for your design data. If you've got a drawing template, for example, 
what you could do is you could store it on everyone's individual local machines and point it to your C drive. OK, so that um, that means that everyone has access to the latest version. OK, because it, they're only working on their machines. The issue is that doesn't drive compliance. And you could be have, say, you've got 10 users. You could have 10 different variances of your drawing book templates going out to companies. And that doesn't look kind of as professional as if everyone's using the same design data, the same templates and the same standards and publishing that that drawing out to, to everyone. So it doesn't give you that kind of global library. So to counteract that, a lot of companies use storing it on a global server or a network server. OK, that obviously, again, has its positives because you've got things like your global libraries and everyone will always have the latest version because it's pointing to that location. Some negatives of it is you don't have any kind of history or version control of that. So if anyone wants to go in and edit or delete that particular file and you don't have a backup of it, they could do that. OK, what it might also um, give you an issue is, is if you're not connected to the network, you might have to be working from home and you might not have access to that particular network drive. You might not have access to the folders, so you might have to copy it local and then you're blending things like your project file and you're falling out of sync with the latest version. The final option and what they've built this new option off of is storing your design data and your templates in vault. So what this third option gives you is it gives you the option for your history because it's obviously checked into Vault and every time you check in a new file, it's going to create a new version. Um, and you get that kind of history or you get that accountability uh, in Vault. You can also have it as a global library because you'll you'll have it set up in Vault. You just have people getting that particular file down from Vault. Now, one issue with that is because you're not working on that file kind of day in, day out, um, you might have to perform a get each time. And if you update that particular drawing file and forget to tell everyone else, it's quite easy to fall out of sync because it's being stored in your local workspace. So this is where Autodesk have introduced the new way or the new method of managing your design data and your templates. And that's with mappings. So what you can do in Inventor is set up your mappings, okay, so that it links into Vault. And what that will mean is every time that you log in or log out, sorry, every time you log back into Vault, what it's going to do is because the mappings have been set up from your local workspace up to that folder in Vault, it's going to run a scan. And if it notices that the files in your local workspace are out of date with that in Vault, it will do a get so that you always have the latest version of that file down in your local workspace. So what you can do is if, again, if you do make a change to a template, it's a lot quicker to tell people, can you just quickly log in and log out of Vault so that you've got the latest templates in there? And also, obviously, if you're shutting down your machine at the end of the day, you're going to be logging out and logging in back in the next day to Vault. And again, it'll be running a scan at that point. So it runs and kind of sets up a kind of manual or automated way, sorry, of um, making sure that you've always got the latest or up-to-date um, templates and design data within your uh, vault and they can see a lot of kind of people going down this route because again it stores it on your local drive if it's stored on a network drive you, you're worrying about kind of internet speeds and, and things like that when you're downloading the file um, or using the file but again because you're downloading it to your local c drive you're only doing that kind of scan once a day and it's going to run quickly when the mappings are set up correctly OK, so the final thing that I'm just going to run through is the backup enhancements. So to do this, I'm just going to quickly run through um, the kind of the general backup settings or the general vault settings that are stored on the server. So on the server, your vault is split up into two kind of key methods or two key areas. So you've got the databases and the databases are uh, where your vault configurations are stored. If you've got more than one vault, that's where they're stored. Also, any kind of custom content center libraries that you've got set up, that's all stored in the databases area. You've then got the secondary area, which is your vault file store. And your vault file store is the um, component that is going to be that um, increases the file size the most, because every time you check a new file into vault, it's going to add that file into the file store. So for kind of medium to large size customers, we tend to see 
um, file store sizes of anything kind of up to two to three terabytes of data, um, whereas your database size on average is around 10 to 20 gig um, for, for a database size, which that is going to completely vary um, between um, the size of the business. But just to, to kind of give you a perspective, the majority of the storage space is stored in your file store. Now, a normal vault backup will take a copy of the file store and the databases and copy it normally locally to the machine. And then a copy of that is then taken or exported off to an external off-site location. So with the kind of the new introduction of servers, servers are now kind of less and less likely people are having physical servers and buying in physical servers. Majority of the time, it tends to be either people using cloud-based servers or uh, virtual machines. Now, the reason for this change and the reason for this kind of new database backup method is that a lot of these virtual machines and a lot of these um, cloud-based servers are automatically backing up the full server. And what they've introduced is a redirect file store option so that you don't have to duplicate that file store. Because if you think if you've got a two terabyte file store, you're duplicating that space. And on a cloud-based server, you're paying for storage. So you're going to be duplicating the, the file store from one server um, from or sorry, on the same server. So you can you would have four terabytes of data that you're paying for um, to, to increase that storage. Whereas actually you might only want to produce or you only need to back up the databases. Now we still always recommend backing up the databases um, because they can become corrupt. So it's always good to have a kind of a daily base, uh, a daily backup um, of your databases that is being run. So with database only backups, we used to previously do this through SQL, but they've now uh, released an official kind of Autodesk um, vault method of doing this. You will see <clears throat> what you've got is the, the database only backup. And what that's going to do is it's going to take just a copy of the databases. So if you do have an issue and you have to restore your vault, what you would do is you would back up or implement your databases and then you would redirect the file store to a backup from your um, your full cloud-based server or your full VM server, depending on, on how that's being run. OK, so it gives you some options to massively reduce the space, but not only space, the time constraints as well. So it might be that you have um, you might want to uh, the backup, sorry, the full backup is taking all night and running into to early the next day. And it's kind of slowing down the vault. It's making the running quite high on the CPU because it's running a full backup and copying that file store every single day. OK, so that's where this database only backup is going to come in. Now, one thing you just need to ensure is that obviously that offsite backup um, is still taking place. So if you do have any questions on your backup methods, feel free to come to us and have a chat to us. We can help kind of point you in the right direction and work out which kind of method is going to be most appropriate for you. So just one other kind of final thing on the database only backups, um, there is now an option to back up individual databases as well. So previously it would just back up everything. OK, if you've got five volts, it might be that you only want to back up one particular vault. Okay, you can now select on that, or you might want to only back up a custom content center library. You can choose in this option in the backup method to select which databases that you want to back up within there. So obviously I haven't had a chance to kind of run through absolutely everything uh, within the, the two pieces of uh, software for 2024. Um, but what we'll do is we'll, we'll get some links sent out to you. We've got some videos um, out as well that um, show kind of some of the new features within there. And I've also put some things on, uh, we'll send some links out for the help file where you can access all of the new information and also that iLogic uh, sample files uh, that we were talking about. So thank you for listening, everyone. Um, I think we're just going to run through some questions. If you've got any questions uh, that you can think of, pop them in the chat window. Uh, Emma, do you want to, have I, we had any yeah, questions? Jason, we've, we've just got one uh, question so far, and it's, does the Fusion 360 PCB now import into Inventor? Um, I'd need to find that out for you. Um, I don't believe it does at the minute. Um, oh, that's more probably from a Fusion side. We need to have a look at it. 
Um, so we'll have a chat with our make team in house. Uh, um, just got another one. Are the new backup options available for Vault Basic as well as Professional? Uh, so no, so that's only for Vault Professional. <laughs> Does Inventor export to Omniverse? Uh, again, that's probably a question for our uh, for our visualization team. Um, I know there has been uh, some talk of um, updating to uh, remember the name of the, the the platform that it's linked to. Um, I will find that again. If we can make a note of that question, apologies. Um, I just need to to double check that with the the visualization team um, just to check that we can we can export it on the first but off the top of my head, I don't think it does natively at the minute. I think there's a third party that you can go through to get the file to there, but I don't think direct. Vault template mapping, the settings. Is there a way to disable or pause this check per user? Maybe as admin, I'm working on new template files. I do not want Vault Vault yet. I want the templates in my Vault location to make sure they are used every time I create files to check the changes are working okay. I don't want to have the Vault overwrite uh, or do I need to modify my local vault file and application options? So if you've yeah, got the okay. mappings, yeah, if you've got the mappings set up, um, it would automatically overwrite your local drive if someone else updates the file. Um, maybe what, again, probably recommend in that instance is that you copy or you've got the file locally, you just amend the name of the file so it's not going to overwrite that file. So you're working on it locally. You can amend the name of the file, um, make the updates, and then rename it back, and then check that file in over the top. Um, unfortunately, there's not a way uh, at the minute um, to uh, block it per user. Um, it's just a general mapping that's set up between um, Inventor and Vault, and it will be set up in the project file. So it might just be probably um you'd have to amend it locally uh, on your machine maybe rename it and then rename it again so that you're checking in that file over the top that could be a good idea for the inventor or the sorry the, the vault forum so again maybe have a look at publishing that on the vault forum and we can have a look at it could i import slash open ifc files e files i need to again apologies have a look at that one um to make sure that we can can import the ifc files uh, just part, uh, sorry, I was late to the webinar. Is there a twist option in Inventor Fabrication? Uh, there isn't not any new features that have been introduced uh, within there. And sorry, yeah, you're just thinking you could probably do that through something uh, using the loft tool. It's probably going to be the easiest way at the minute, or depending on the shape of the coil tool. Is there an Inventor app to production staff to only view 3D without Inventor Live? Um, so there is uh, an option to export the files to the Autodesk online viewer. Um, that is free. They'll just have to have an Autodesk account to be able to view the files. Um, so if you just search for Autodesk viewer, um, there's the option to, to just export to that particular viewer um, in Inventor and you, you should be able to um, access that. And if you have Vault as well, you have the share view option within Vault. Um, and you also have the thin client, which will create your, um, your if you're using visualization files, that's used based off the forward viewer, which is what the Autodesk viewer is based on. Another one, in the past, when I have stored the design data folder in Vault, there have been problems because the design data folder contains duplicate file names. Is this taken into consideration for the workspace sync functionality? Yes, uh, so the way that you would, uh, initially get your uh, design data into Vault is you would you would have to turn that um, option off otherwise it's going to import it with the same file names unfortunately um, but you can turn that off import your design data into Vault and then um, turn it back on again so that obviously you're not importing duplicate file names within there um, but obviously that's just a one-time procedure once you once them files are in Vault you won't need to, to worry about that. That mapping is, is then worked through correctly. Is the yeah. simplified bounding box command available in Inventor 2019? Uh, it isn't, unfortunately. So the simplify used to be um, shrink wrap. Um, so again, if you're looking in 2019, you'd be using the shrink wrap functionality. Um, 
there isn't a bounding box functionality, I don't believe, until 2022. Um, there is for part files, um, but that's a separate tool previously. Uh, it's now all been kind of implemented into the simplify command, which came in in the 22 release. Finish up by saying some of them questions, obviously, the, the PCB, the Omniverse and the IFC files. Um, if you just either want to drop me an email or we'll, we'll make sure we, we take your email address and I'll make sure I get back to you with the, the appropriate responses on them. Um, but yeah, again, thank you, everyone, for attending today. Um, and we'll send out some useful kind of links and, and things like that. And if you do have any kind of other questions that you think of, feel free to drop me an email. Cheers, Emma. Thank you.